At a time when the nuclear age was less than 10 years old, a team of Argonne scientists, engineers, and technicians, led by Dr. Walter H. Zinn, made a giant step into the future of atomic energy. In the design and operation of the experimental breeder reactor one, they proved a fast reactor's capability to produce more fuel than it consumes, and used EBR-1 to generate the first useful quantities of electricity from atomic energy. On Friday, August 26, 1966, during a visit by President Lyndon B. Johnson to the National Reactor Testing Station near Idaho Falls, Idaho, EBR-1 was designated a National Historic Landmark. More than 15,000 people were on hand when President Johnson arrived at the central facilities of the National Reactor Testing Station. He was accompanied by Mrs. Johnson, the Chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, Dr. Glenn Seaborg, members of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, and a large delegation of prominent national and regional dignitaries. In the course of his address, President Johnson reiterated the central meaning of the EBR-1. So we have come to a place today where hope was born that man would do more with his discovery than unleash destruction in its wake. On this very spot, the United States produced the world's first electricity from nuclear energy. The president went on to say, this energy is to propel the machines of progress, to light our cities and our towns, to fire our factories, to provide new sources of fresh water, and to really help us solve the mysteries of outer space as it brightens our life on this planet. What happened here merely raised the curtain on a very promising drama in our long journey for a better life. In accepting the plaque designating EBR-1 as a National Historic Landmark from Undersecretary of the Interior John Carver on behalf of the Atomic Energy Commission, Dr. Seaborg commented, I accept it also on behalf of the National Reactor Testing Station and the Argonne National Laboratory, whose representatives are here today, and whose outstanding scientists and engineers made the EBR-1 possible and thereby created this landmark in our atomic age, as well as in our national history. On this occasion, I would like to give special recognition to the Argonne National Laboratory, whose pioneering work in the nuclear field has been responsible for so many of the advances we are enjoying today in this important field. From central facilities, the President and Mrs. Johnson went to the Experimental Breeder Reactor 1. Dr. Stephen Lorowski, Associate Laboratory Director, greeted them at EBR-1 and introduced Dr. Walter H. Zinn, Vice President of Combustion Engineering, Dr. George Beadle, President of the University of Chicago, and Meyer Novick, Director of Argonne's Idaho Division. The visit had an atmosphere of pleasant excitement, coupled with the usual stir of the press and the photographers. as the fuel. This, I know, pleases Dr. Seaborg very much, since he is the co-discoverer of the element of identification. Yes. At this time, I'd like to interrupt for a very brief moment and ask you and Chairman Seaborg to complete the installation of this flag. You think we can do this? So if you would turn in the screws. It's quite an assignment. <laughs> I think they made it pretty easy, Mr. President. That's fine, Bill. I gave this. I'm going to get yeah, you. You may have to check to be sure we've done it. Is this the same one we had over there? <laughs> is this the same one? It sure is. Yes, you it got is. it over here that bad? That's pretty good. I don't know if I can lift it. 
Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. We'll see to it that you receive uh, the as the members uh, of your uh, finishing the. You won't get them mixed up. No. <laughs> Now, the reactor itself is located behind this massive uh, concrete shield, and because of that, uh, one can never see the reactor. However, As Dr. Lorowski escorted the President and Mrs. Johnson on a tour of the facility, he described major features of the EBR-1, utilizing photographs and reactor components on display. The president was very attentive as they moved through the facility and up to the historic turbine generator, giving special attention to the signatures on the wall of the 16 men who were present when EBR-1 first generated electricity. Along with the constant press of photographers was the quiet and efficient control of White House personnel and the Secret Service. Completing the tour, they returned to the face of the reactor shield. Meyer Novick, a senior engineer at EBR-1 at the time it was built, and now director of the Idaho division, introduced to the president those whose names appear on the wall. Harold Lechtenberger, who was the project manager of this project at that time. Mr. Cerruti, engineer. Mr. Cameron. Mr. Widow. Mr. Wilkie. Mr. Johnson. Mr. King. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Lofton. Dr. Zinn. Mr. Koch. Mr. McKenna. Mr. Stonehocker. And Mr. Pettit. More pictures, this time with members of the Commission and the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Then the President of the University of Chicago, Dr. George Beadle, presented President Johnson with a token symbolizing EBR-1's historic achievements. My honor to have this little token on this occasion. And uh, <coughs> here it is. It's a light bulb. But it's not an ordinary light bulb. It's a, it's a burst light bulb that was lighted by energy from a nuclear reactor powered by plutonium. And it's yours that is to remember this occasion by. Yes, and we're honored and we thank you. Yeah. The first. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. One more. <laughs> In spite of the pleasant admonishment, the president graciously consented to a group picture with the 16 members of the Argonne team present.
need to go, Mr. President. Before saying goodbye, the President and Mrs. Johnson had a few words with former Congressman Ralph Harding from Idaho. This was the first time a President of the United States had visited the National Reactor Testing Station. And it is a matter of pride to Argonne and all the people connected with the success of EBR-1 that it was on the occasion designating the Experimental Breeder Reactor 1 as a National Historic Landmark. As the President was leaving EBR-1, visitors to the site started to arrive for the dedication open house. Argonne staff were on hand to answer questions for more than 1,000 visitors to EBR-1 on this historic Friday afternoon. That evening at the Idaho Falls Elks Club, the Eastern Idaho Chambers of Commerce hosted a banquet in connection with the EBR-1 dedication with special honored guests. Following are brief excerpts from some of the informal talks. Commissioner Gerald Tate. There is extreme competition. There is extreme urgency in many of the programs we do. And that there are very great opportunities for all of us to join together in programs which are of sufficient interest and urgency for the commission. So I look forward to a very good continuing relationship with our Idaho friends and the work here in Idaho. Thanks very much. Commissioner Sam Nabrit. The first generation of electricity in this country from atomic reactors and to participate in a program in which our president came this far to dedicate this reactor is really a historical moment uh, in my own life. The chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, Dr. Glenn Seaborg. For the operation of the Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, as we've uh, indicated, uh, the experimental breeder reactor number one is uh, a historic facility indeed. It is the first reactor in which electricity was produced from nuclear power not only in the United States, but anywhere in the world. It was the first reactor that uh, was to be fueled entirely with plutonium to produce electricity. And it was the first reactor that demonstrated the fast breeder principle for the production of plutonium from uranium. I think it's very appropriate this evening that I present this uh, certificate to President George Beadle. I'm not sure what he will do with it, but I give it to him to do as he will. Thank you very much, Glenn. I want to say that uh, I'm very proud on behalf of the Argonne National Laboratory uh, to accept this certificate. Uh, we at the university, all of the people concerned with the Argonne National Laboratory are very proud of this achievement. We're proud of the work of the Argonne National Laboratory and particularly uh, the Idaho Division. Uh, I want to say that uh, this, this award is symbolic of the work in uh, the field of nuclear reactors, nuclear power, and as you know, much of this work has been done here in the uh, Idaho test site. <clears throat> I would uh, like to present this certificate in turn uh, to a person who has been largely responsible uh, for this work, namely uh, Dr. Stephen Larosky, 
who is Associate Director of the Argonne National Laboratory for Reactor Technology and, at the present time, Acting Director of the Argonne National Laboratory. Steve, would you come up and accept the certificate? It was a memorable day. There are a lot of factors that go into deciding how these materials can be shipped. The mode of transportation normally is chosen by the weight of the shipment and delivery requirements of that shipment. Ninety-five percent of all radioactive shipments are shipped by air due to the fact that they're required in hospitals and radio radiation uh, laboratories. Uh, for large shipments, the size of the shipment and the weight of the shipment uh, determine the mode of carriage. For smaller shipments, uh, those would go by a truck, then you have rail for the next largest size, and for the very large shipments, those go by water. Radioactive materials may be transported by truck, plane, rail car, or ship. But almost two-thirds of all shipments, those used in medical and research facilities, are low enough in weight and radioactivity to be safely transported by plane. All methods of transport are evaluated according to strict guidelines. Truck routes for shipments of materials that exceed a certain level of radiation are carefully selected to minimize risk and maximize safety. Carriers are required to evaluate routes based on transit time, population density and activities, time of day and day of week, and highway accident rate. For shipments of highway route controlled quantities, those with high levels of radioactivity, the Department of Transportation designates preferred routes, usually interstates or bypass routes around cities. State or tribal authorities may select alternate routes based on local considerations, as long as the routes are in compliance with DOT requirements. Rail, air, and water methods of transport are also subject to safety and efficiency evaluations. Additional safety is ensured by driver regulations. Any driver transporting hazardous or radioactive materials must have a commercial driver's license and specialized training in safe handling and transport procedures. The Department of Energy extensively trains all its personnel who are involved with radioactive material shipment and handling. When DOE shipments of spent fuel, high-level waste, and other highly radioactive materials are in transit, they're tracked by the Department of Energy's TRANSCOM system. Through communication equipment and a satellite position reporting system, the DOE monitors the location and status of these shipments and allows local agencies to stay informed about shipments in their areas.